when I started working for myself um, six, seven years ago now, uh, following my second redundancy, um, I took it on myself basically to say yes to everything, to get as busy as I possibly can, to follow my uh, decision to, to go self-employed, to, I guess, prove point to everyone uh, and try and prove to myself that uh, I could provide for my family in a way that I wanted to. We talk to a lot of people in leadership, in management, who are busy with a lot of work pressures, who struggle to say no, uh, who constantly say yes to everything that comes their way. And simply by piling more stuff on and more pressure on themselves can um, sleepwalk, uh, accidentally go into what we call burnout. And in this conversation with burnout um, prevention specialist and burnout recovery specialist, Matt Appleby, we explore what causes burnout, what can trigger burnout, how can we manage with burnout, uh, and what can we do day to day um, ourselves to take more responsibility to, I guess, check in to see if we're at risk of burnout, and what can we do to ultimately prevent that, um, to manage the boundaries better, manage our time better, and be more responsible for our own actions. So it was a really good conversation. I hope you find a lot of help in this. It's perfect for those who are struggling with being over busy, uh, feel like they don't have a place to go and share and talk to anyone um, about the risks that they see coming down the track. So let's go and uh, see what me and Matt discussed. So welcome along um, to the latest in the video series from the Dads in Business podcast. Uh, my name is Rob Taylor from Dads in Business, the place where we are aiming and on a bit of a mission to help busy dads, busy working dads and busy dads in business bring the best of themselves to work and to home. Um, burnout is, is a huge issue that I think goes probably unnoticed or certainly unspoken about, I'd say perhaps more with dads or with men. And it's something we'll uncover today with our, our specialist in that area, uh, wellbeing coach and burnout prevention specialist, Matt Appleby. Uh, Matt, good morning to you. Uh, how are you? And could you give a brief introduction uh, to the audience today? Hi, Rob. I'm very well, thank you. Um, great to be here. Um, so, yeah, I am a burnout recovery specialist. Um, I help dads in particular recover from burnout. Um, because that was my own experience six years ago when I, shortly after I became a new dad. Um, and in the last few years, I've, I've completely changed direction in career. And now I help other people with their well-being. Wow, excellent. It's, um, it's great to have you here. So firstly, thank you for, for giving up your time to, to have a chat about it. I think it's a very, um, a very important topic is burnout. And I think... You know, when I first started in first um, in self-employment from my second redundancy, if you like, I think six months after that, soon after that, I was probably very close to burnout. But it wasn't until someone slapped me in the face with a list of what burnout might have been that <laughs> I realised that oh, hang on, that that might be I might be getting close to this. So, so I guess to kick us off, Matt, would you would you mind, I guess, defining what burnout is what are its I guess firstly its symptoms but then what are it maybe some of its common causes for, for dads specifically yeah. in your space yeah of course so um the three areas that that show up the most uh, and from what I experienced and you know I can only really talk about my own direct experience was the physical side of things feeling depleted feeling exhausted and mm -hmm. um, feeling like you never rested enough um, they were the sort of the first warning signs. Um, the mental stuff was for me that the way I got to that position was I kept pushing on. I wouldn't stop. Um, so there's obviously a link there with the, the physical side of things. Um, I was quite sort of black and white at that, that time. I, I was very much must carry on, must um, maintain the norm, that, that kind of messaging to myself. Um, and the emotional stuff was around, um, I guess I wasn't really prepared to, fully prepared to be a dad or, and, and know what that was about um, because it was brand new to me. Um, I joke um, quite regularly with my partner that for the first eight months of her pregnancy, I kind of hid away from it and denied it. And then the last month I was like, 
my god I better do something about this <laughs> I've got a nursery to put together and you know all the rest of it and then it becomes very real um and from that sort of point onwards until sort of six months in um I just didn't stop I just kept carrying on um I was working a busy full-time job back then um corporate job in IT um not long prior to that I'd had a promotion so I had extra responsibilities and sort of people management um uh, type responsibilities there so I was taking all that on board um I was of course a new dad and as you know that's a huge thing in it in and of itself um but I'd also started doing a yoga teacher training program which was my um sort of real focus and love at the time I'd fallen in love with yoga I've been practicing for a few years um, and I started that literally I think it was one or two weeks after my son was born wow um yeah <laughs> which um, in hindsight probably not the best timing but um I'm so glad I did it then because it, it gave me a real focus and something for me if that makes sense because mm. you know one of the things we've talked about in the past is that um when you become a dad you, you sort of lose a lot of identity you know the things that are the norm slip away so you don't see your mates as much you stop doing the, the other things that you love doing as much and that for me was like oh yeah this is mine and I've got all this other new stuff but that's for me to kind of keep me sane and mm. in the right uh, place. and I think it's <laughs> um I, I can certainly connect with with some of those um I guess symptoms that you were you were highlighting there that sort of the won't stop sort of thing that mm. um I, I'm never done. It was what's next, what's next. And I've still got that mentality about it. I think that's probably part of me. And I, and I don't want to, I guess there's a risk. We try and dampen down the positive parts of ourselves as well, because we yeah. deem it as a negative. And I think as long as you're in control and responsible for it, then it's not, it's not so much a bad thing, but I think early days, it, it was, I, d I don't know, Matt, did you ever get the thing where you wouldn't stop because you had to prove a point to someone else? <laughs> Because mine was very much a, I'm going to do this because I chose to go into self-employment. So therefore mm. I'm going to prove to everyone that it was the right decision to do. I think I can mm. look back at that now and always yeah. see it as like a stubbornness thing, which was almost yeah. leading to my not stopping. For me, it wasn't so much that because at that point I wasn't yet in self-employment. Mm. So I was, I was still working a corporate job. Um, but I, I think there was definitely an element of that sort of proving to myself that I felt like I was superhuman. Yeah, you know, I, I can do this. Stop. I can do this. Yeah, I can do this. I can do that. Yeah. yeah, just keep adding stuff in, and I'll I'll manage. It's fine. Mm, it's... It was it was that kind of approach. Yeah, yeah, and, and in terms of, I guess the causes. You know, we, we've touched on a few of the symptoms. Mm -hmm. What can cause burnout? Do you think? For me, in my own experience at that time, it was, um, what I perceived to be. The societal pressures and, and norms and you know as a as a father uh, being seen as the provider um my partner was obviously on maternity leave um being there to sort of care and look after her and my new baby um and i very much kind of flung myself into that role as well as keeping everything else spinning you know mm. Um, keeping the house in some kind of order, um, still performing at work or trying to perform at work, where actually I was just stretching myself far too, too much. Yeah, yeah. We, we just take more on and more mm. on, and more. And and do you think some of that is is almost reflective of stigmas or stereotypes around what a dad should do? Or, you know, dads should take all this responsibility on. It's their role to do it all and protect the mother and the baby obviously that's that is part of our role but by doing everything mm -hmm. is, is there a certain stigma or stereotype around that being what we have to do so therefore to question it or to say i need a bit of help yeah could show up as a bit of weakness do you think absolutely yeah yeah you've hit the nail on the head i think um generally speaking a, you know, a huge stereotype but men on the whole aren't so good at asking for help I'm one of those guys. Yeah. I'm better at it now, certainly. Um, but <clears throat> there's a, a definite stigma there around that and sort of saying, actually, could you just help me out here? And a lot of the time, it's knowing where to go for that help. Hmm. Yeah, it might not necessarily be your immediate circle, your network, your friends. It might be 
you might have to see a professional or you know and and that is a big step people yeah and i think uh, it's, <clears throat> it's part of i guess the reason why we set up this this dad's in business project because it was mm. I, I was probably at that phase i was thinking well, he's busy this and wherever i'd go i'd have to come home Oh, I perceived I had to come home and the missus would say, how's work? And I'd have to say everything's fine because mm-hmm. to say otherwise would worry her while she's got new new kids and young kids. I'd go back to the work setting or networks mm. and I'd say, how's work and how's home? It's all just fine. Don't worry, I'm, everything's great. You'd even go out to the pub every, well, <laughs> a lot less frequently than you would before. <laughs> um, and they'd be like, how's things? Everything's fine. Let's talk about football. And there was never that grown-up space to say, well, I've barely had any sleep. I don't really know what I'm doing. Work's been a quiet month, and I've got no clue what to do. So that that's kind of where I first put my head above the parapet, if you like. I said, is anyone else feeling like this? Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of other dads and partners started coming forward and, and tagging themselves or their husband, partner, into post saying, this sounds like you. So it's obviously a very common, a very common feeling, and, and I guess it's it's leading to my question to ask about you know you specialise in um, recovery of burnout for dads. Why do you think dads are struggling with it so much? Why do you think there is that that space to set up a, a burnout recovery program just for dads? Where, what, where's where's that come from? Do you think? I feel like um, we've hit the nail on the head already with those couple of bits. So around the fact that it, it's a big leap of faith, sort of first acknowledge that we are burnt out or feeling like something's a mess. And that in itself, that very first step is huge until we actually say to ourselves, oh yeah, hang on a minute, I'm doing too much. Something needs to change. We can't make a change until that happens. We're just so busy spinning on the plates we get lost in the busyness of life that it, we kind of convince ourselves that we're okay. And that's why I, exactly what I did. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and those, those stigmas that we've talked about that we rightly or wrongly associate with our role as such. Yeah. Our stereotype this is what I should mm. be doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. and, and I guess Matt, we talked a little bit about symptoms and causes do you mind sharing a bit about your your story about how you actually realized that oh my god i have burnt out did you get that far Um, yeah absolutely yeah so um for me it was i've kind of led into the story but i from sort of my my eldest being born i i just kept powering on and you know this this huge life event of becoming a father um, I kept everything else spinning as best I could um, whilst taking on all the extra stuff. So, you know, the things that come with a baby, the sleepless nights, the waking up, um, the sort of operating on reduced amount of sleep and less rest and all the other, all the other things that come as part of parcel of that. Um, and it was something quite innocuous at first. I became unwell. Um, I actually got an ear infection um, and I didn't take time to rest. I didn't take time out to, to sort of stop and recover. Um, and this perpetuated, I had two or three, or maybe four, I can't remember at the time. Um, and each time I didn't stop. I just thought I'm taking these drugs from the, the GP. They'll sort it. Um, everything's fine. Carry on. And my energy levels just went slowly downhill and then quite rapidly downhill. Um, and ultimately, I needed six months off of work. So, yeah, I took um, a long time off of work and um, quite early on had two or three failed return to work attempts where I genuinely couldn't um, manage half a day because I was so so exhausted, so depleted. Um, and then had to go through all occupational health um, steps and all that kind of stuff. And that was difficult as well, quite a challenge. Um, you know, at my worst, I was pretty much sleeping all night, 
sleeping most of the day, as in unable to stay awake, apart from when I was eating, if I felt like eating. So I, I just really needed that deep rest. Um, and my kind of experience of occupational health wasn't particularly helpful because I was sent to see these sort of specialists as such um, a couple of times. One of them told me I would never return to work. It's like, oh, my God. There's a, there's a proactive meeting. Yeah. For you. <laughs> a, another one said it would take me years. I was like, geez, okay. So that is, you know, when you're vulnerable anyway, you know, there's a lot of emotional stuff there as well because when you're told these things and you're struggling to stay awake during the day, you're just like, what's going on? Am I okay? Um, so obviously there was a mental health aspect to it. Um, fortunately, I think I'm, I'm quite a resilient person in, in that um, aspect. I, I've definitely suffered with that in the past, but um, by that time in life, I was a bit more resilient, but that was certainly a, a part of it. I felt, you know, it was a very dark time. Um, the thing, the, the kind of turning point for me is um, because of what I do, my interests, um, I'm always open to sort of alternative methods, alternative um, therapies. Um, and I'd been working with a, um, a therapist, I guess you call her, um, for a little while prior to this event and got in touch with her and said, this is my situation. Is there anything you can do to help? What do you suggest? Um, and she said, have I ever talked to you about something called Panchakarma? And I knew a little bit about it. So Panchakarma is, um, it's like a retreat. You go away a week, completely shut off. Um, it's in a rural setting. There's no kind of fluence in so devices out of the way, all computers, you're not allowed to take anything, you don't consume any news. And it's um, um, like a cleansing detox, I guess. <clears throat> Excuse me. A detox is probably the best way I can um, summarize it. You have a number of therapies every day. You have a, a kind of a really deep massage and steam. And it's about working out your um, um, stuff from the inside out. So one of the, um, um, it's founded in something called Ayurveda, which is a, a sister science to yoga. So it's traditional Indian medicine. And um, so it was the precursor to, to all sort of modern healthcare medicine, medical systems. Um, and um, one of the kind of the phrases that, that often sticks with me is um, sort of one of the, um, the leading voices in it, um, a, a doctor called Dr. Ladd, who's Indian, um, says the issues are in your tissues. So you work at a deep level, working out the stuff from the inside out. Um, and you have the, these therapy, you basically have a load of time and space to kind of process whatever's going on. This isn't specific to burnout, by the way, but it, it just so happened to be um, available and an opportunity for me. So I took myself away for that um, relatively early on into that six months. And it wasn't really until that point that I kind of went, oh yeah, okay, I'm burnt out. Because when I'd seen sort of the um, more traditional um, specialists, um, doctors, um, occupational health people like that, it was very much, you've got um, uh, post-viral fatigue, you've got, I, I was fortunate in that I'd seen a, a really good, um, I forget what his um, specialism was, general medicine, I think, um, consultant. And I, I was really fortunate that I had private healthcare through work, so I was encouraged to use that. But he um, did loads of tests on me um, and said, you've got this virus. Um, and this is good news because of the route that occupational health have taken and, you know, the messaging that's coming from them that, you know, you need to take a long, slow recovery. And he said, nine times out of 10, in cases similar to yours, I'll do all these tests and genuinely can't find anything. So there's no kind of evidential 
prove this is, this is the cause. But I've got um, a virus called cytomegalovirus, CNV, it's known as, quite common. It presents very similar to um, glandular fever, Epstein-Barr virus, so it same kind of symptoms, extreme fatigue, um, all the rest of it that goes with it. Um, so he said, yeah, you've got that post-viral fatigue, take your time. I cannot say how long it's going to take you to recover. Um, so that was a positive on the more kind of traditional routes. Um, but it wasn't until I went away for this retreat for a week that I kind of went, oh, yeah, OK, I really need to take this seriously and stop. And I, it's one of those things where, in hindsight, I'll never know whether, I'll, know, I'll never know the difference had I have not gone away for that. But it, to me, it, my instinct is, my intuition is that that was a big part of my sort of healing process. Mm, wow. And thanks for, for sharing so <clears> such <throat> in depth about, about that. I'm sure a lot of that will sound familiar, uh, mm -hmm. I think, to, to people listening. Um, yeah. I wondered, was work... I know you mentioned you had private healthcare through through work. Were they supportive during this time? Did they did they um, did they offer you support? Were they in touch regular? Was it was it a good place hmm. to be? Yes and no. It was. It's so tricky in those kind of circumstances because I worked for a big corporate, um, and the rules of engagement are quite sort of murky. So obviously, I had a live manager. Well, it very much had to be on a pre-arranged basis that we got in touch. Um, all very procedural and, you know, to keep in line with HR and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and thanks, it was good on a whole, but it, it was very kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it was quite like, regimented. Yeah, it was very regimented. Um, and I think, I mean, my own experience was, was that being in a, in a big corporate, but I guess I that's what, what, sorry, go on. That's one of the challenges, that's one of the challenges of being in that environment, isn't it? It's, you know, there are certain rules and procedures around HR and yeah, that did seem quite procedural. Mm. but I guess by its nature it that's what it is yeah yeah and, and did you um did you worry about speak do you, do you feel you could have spoken up before you sort of gone over the edge but you couldn't because there was a a stigma there or you know, I can't I can't say that I'm just a bit tired for example mm. um or did it go too far and were there warning signs before that that you could have you could have flagged it up do you think yeah there were definitely warning signs and um, you know I thought it out sort of being unwell. Uh, I definitely was guilty of not resting during that time. Um, in hind like hindsight, it's a great thing, isn't it? Yeah. I could, pro I could probably have been more proactive and done a lot more and sort of said um, to people around me, you know, I need a bit of help here or need a bit more time out. I didn't. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I knew then yeah. what I know now, sort of thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and as well, I guess a lot of the yeah. symptoms you you sort of reference, and I guess when you went to the occupational health uh, department, it yeah. it's there's a lot of similarities with depression as well. And, mm -hmm. and are, are the two related? Is burnout related to depression? Can we misdiagnose? Can we? spot some signs of something that are actually I, something else Where, where's the hmm. difference i think that this, uh, there's certainly a big crossover I, i've experienced depression myself in the past i was definitely depressed to a to a certain extent when i uh, um yeah it, it's one of those areas where it's i guess it's open to interpretation you know which is the which is the precipitating sort of thing is it i was depressed and therefore became burnt out or i was burnt out and therefore became depressed who knows everyone's unique and um we all respond to our environment and external stimulus in different ways um for me it was i didn't feel depressed or 
didn't feel like I had any mental health kind of concerns leading up to being burnt out, but I definitely experienced a consequence of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess sort of fast forwarding out of that and through your recovery a, a little bit, you now you now specialise in helping other dads um, recover, and I assume prevent uh, prevent as well. Yeah. I guess why dads? Do you do you think there is a, um, a, a an overarching risk or a bigger risk for dads that are brushing things under the carpet and just carrying on regardless and not stopping and just taking on more and more and more and more? Do you mm-hmm. think do you think that's more prevalent in in dads, new dads particularly, or or dads with growing kids as well? I mean, <clears throat> speak from my experience as a dad, you know, I. I've experienced the mother's role, but I can't speak directly about that. Mm. Um, my my belief is because of the the things that we've covered so far, you know, the stigmas, the pressures we put on ourselves, um, the way that certainly British societies. Um, not designed, designed isn't the right word, um, sort of plays out around the birth of children, there's a hell of a lot of focus on the mum, and quite rightly so. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Quite rightly so. Um, <clears throat> I think dads are often overlooked in that um, that aspect because it's such a such a huge event for us as well. Um, and sort of little things that build up to the, the picture of it is, I, I don't know if you had the experience because I, I know you've got children yourself, um, but when I went to, along to sort of baby classes and toddler classes as, as my children were growing up, I very much felt it, it was very often that I was the only dad there, mm-hmm. or one, maybe one or two. There might have been a grand of supporting and helping out, but um, that is quite a big thing to get your head around. And then, <clears throat> because, you know, the mums, you know, naturally get on better um, and relate better because they've got a, a like experience. And then it can be a bit of a bit of one of those where you know, there's a room full of mums and their kids and then the dad walks in, you get a bit of tumbleweed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. The yeah. coffee cups go down and there's a, <laughs> there's a slow turn to this weirdo that just <laughs> walked in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, I, I can connect it's, to that because I think um, hmm. the we for our first uh, we never went back. I've got three kids. We never went back to them, but we went to the um, antenatal classes. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you went to those um, when you were expecting, but mm-hmm. my goodness, they were a horrible, <laughs> horrible waste of time. As <laughs> um, there's just I often say they don't teach dad in school, and oh. you know. I didn't know what I was doing, becoming a dad. I was, oh. I guess I was relatively young. I was 29 when I first became a dad. Probably okay. the first out of my social circle, I think, pretty much to have kids. Uh, my brother's older than me and he, he hadn't got kids. Yeah. Uh, my dad, he passed away many years ago and I couldn't ask him what to do. It was very much just me. I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Let's go and try these antenatal classes. This will help me out. So we went along and and this was an NHS one. And it was just, it was almost just like a propaganda session for breastfeeding. That's all it was. Mm-hmm. And they even gave me a, a knitted boob and said, this is how the woman would do it. And I'm thinking, well, why is this of any value to me yeah. at all? And it was supposed to be two sessions and we just, we didn't go back to the second session. It was just, it was just pointless, but, Underneath all that, I think there's a very serious thing. If there, there wasn't that support there to help expectant dads. Mm-hmm. Ones where your rhythm is going to be changed, your life's going to be changed. And if you're busy at work, if you're busy in your business, there's this whole level of responsibility that's coming down the line. And it just seemed, I don't know what your experiences were, but it seemed like there was no, there was no support. There was no teaching or training. It's kind of, you just, there you go. Yeah. And I was still employed at this time. and you have two weeks off and it's as if you've had two week holiday mm-hmm. and then you go back to mm-hmm. work and that's it. 
Yeah. Back at it. <laughs> it's, it's a very bizarre experience. And I think it's no wonder that that burnout crops up. Mm-hmm. Because if if it is if there is a perception that men, and I know there's a lot of other work and you know, I and the Dads in Business Project don't particularly specialise around the, the equal maternity leaves, but I know there's a lot of people pushing for a, a different agenda there. But if there is this perception that dads get a two-week holiday when they have a newborn child, then they have to go back and the expectation is they're on their A game instantly. Yeah. But then the expectation is that you're helping out at home as well, even though you've just had the same or more busyness at work, so therefore you're tired too. Then you have to come home and be on your A game as well. Yeah. It's no wonder that everything's full. So mm. something has to give somewhere, doesn't it? Yeah. And also... So um, that's reminding me, actually. I remember having a few conversations with people, um, including other dads. They kind of tongue in cheek said, oh, you get a two-week holiday. Like, yeah, some holiday, that is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's unbelievable, isn't if, it? If only you were resting. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I'm not by any means saying that it's it's, mm. it's on par with what, what the women go through. Of course, it's it's mm-hmm. it, it's not, but mm. it is challenging. Mm-hmm. And I just think there's there's a lot of a lot of work to be done. And if if burnout is, I guess the the signal that something's gone wrong. I have burned out. A lot of things have gone on before that to make that happen. I, I assume burnout doesn't just happen. It yeah. manifests over time and it shows yeah. up over time. And if there's nowhere for for dads to to share that and support that or check in with themselves if need be and manage it themselves, then then how does it change? It's only going to get worse, isn't it? There's a lot more pressures, I guess, as March 2020 happened, which seems a very long time ago now. <laughs> we all were granted the opportunity to stop. And I think if, if you could have embraced that or did embrace that, I speak to a lot of businesses where they're owner managed or they're in busy leadership or management positions. And it's almost like the goal of success or the measure of success is how many hours you work. Mm -hmm. I work 80 hours. I work 90 Mm. hours. It's like that Monty Python sketch almost (laughs) where, (laughs) <laughs> yeah. that talks about how, how hard everyone works. Yeah. But then we, then we all had to stop. And we spoke to a lot of people during that time and they were loving it. They're like, mm-hmm. I've actually seen my kids. I'm enjoying time yeah. spending with the family and doing bits of work that I can. Mm. But then as soon as the traps were lifted, and I've said this in other conversations that we've had, it seemed like the race to 80 hours a week was back on again. And whoever got there first was the winner. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And have, have, have we learned nothing during this time? I mean, what's your what's your experiences with that? What are, what are dads doing? Are they racing to busy or are they racing more for a better balance, do you think? Personally speaking, I from my experience of burnout, one of the the things I took away from it was I vowed that I would make big changes. So I was doing my yoga teacher training program and I knew that I'd I would love to do more around that. So in a couple of years of going to work, I, I've moved away from corporate work altogether. Um, and that was very much around getting a, a better balance to life, um, having more um, harmony in sort of my day-to-day. So I was able to be around more for my children. Um, I wasn't tied to a nine-to-five, so to speak. Um, and all the pressures that come with that. Um, so yeah, I can I can definitely see elements of of how burnout showed up with me that I was kind of racing towards burnout. Um, you know, I, I was I, I remember distinctly a a real um, uh, sorry, vividly a, a kind of extended period when my youngest was very little. And I would take him out for walks sort of first thing in the morning. I'm talking like before six, like five, six o'clock, um, because we'd had a bad night or whatever, and he was up. And, and then I was still going off to work at sort of eight o'clock. And then <clears throat> probably bring work home. And, um, you know, and then coming home to, you know, see your partner who's 
had a tough day with a baby and you know how that goes <laughs> you don't need to call that anymore. you're then <laughs> kind of picking up those pieces as well and and then you think oh my god i've got all those emails to send and i didn't do this that and the other at work because i was so knackered <laughs> so, <laughs> and it just perpetuates doesn't it yeah, <clears throat> yeah. absolutely yeah there's no boundaries yeah. i guess is a, is a big no. thing isn't it and no. that losing hmm. your sense of self which mm. early on in our chat chat today you, you mentioned that you um you took lessons to for, for yoga wasn't it it was it was yoga classes yeah. to become a yoga teacher yeah, yeah. and uh, and i think that's an important step because something else we see very often as i'm sure you can relate to is we lose the sense of self don't we it's like well i, yeah. I either work or i have to be at home mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what what is there for for me in the middle of that my social yeah. life goes a little bit i don't talk to my friends as much as i used to i used to go football do this do that fitness goes mm. So I guess finding time for that is difficult as well, uh, but it's vital, isn't it? Yeah, and yeah. Especially our fitness, because yeah, fitness is a big part absolutely. of what, what your focus is now, isn't it? The um, Yeah. How, how does that help, I guess, prevent burnout, um, mm. keep us in check, keep us responsible? Mm. Um, what's the power of fitness around that? Because often it's the first thing to go, isn't it? It is, yeah. So... Um... Interestingly, I, from an early age, I've always been a, a gym goer. So I joined my first gym at 16. And it had been something I'd done, been ever present until I became a dad. <clears throat> and at that time in life, I consciously stopped going to the gym. Um, and that was because I was quite realistic. Uh, I knew something had to drop. Um, prior to being a dad, I went probably two, three, maybe more times a week. Um, for at least 45 minutes an hour. Showered, changed all the rest of it. Talking an hour and a half, maybe, mm. each time. So that's a big time commitment. Um, but because of where I was at, and I was doing all this yoga practice and immersing myself in my studies, I thought, I don't need to do that anymore. I had these rose-tinted glasses. Um, and fast forward a couple of, no, maybe, 18, I'd recognize I've lost strength. <clears throat> As a consequence of experience of burnout, my energy levels were all over the place. So even when I had recovered, and still today, I have to really manage them closely, it could be very up and down. <clears throat> and I'd be, I get to sort of mid afternoon, I'd be flagging. Um, so I, I discovered um, something called Fit20 um, in November 2018 joined as a customer bearing in mind at that point i'm not lifted any weights as such for 18 months probably a bit longer and it was fantastic within sort of three months or more maybe slightly more i'd got my strength back my energy levels had started to even out it really helped my posture and i felt much more kind of vibrant and better in myself and it's like anything, you take something away, um, it become, you get used to it and you sort of forget about it. You forget your, your love of that thing or, or why it really benefited you. And quite quickly, um, I realised what I'd missed from sort of that element, the strength training part of it. Um, and I saw what a great um, method it was and approach to to strength and health and wellness for especially for busy people um so much so that i bought the business a few months later <laughs> because i saw what a, what a great compliment it was to to yoga practice to being self-employed to being busy um, and how it can help um and my journey very much over the last 10 and more years has been around um how can I help people with their health and well-being? Uh, it's it, it plugs a lot of gaps, doesn't it? There, it yeah. stops a lot of excuses. I haven't got time for the gym. It's twenty minutes. Yeah, I don't have time for that. It's it's too much effort. It, it's twenty minutes. Mm. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, without going too deep into it, how how can you get fit in twenty minutes? What a week! Yes, 
it, it sounds like it sounds like you're yeah. selling me a silver how bullet. Here, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how's it in, in a I, nutshell? I, how's that work? I asked the same question. So it's <clears throat> because of my experience, I was used to very traditional methods. I really questioned it and I almost joined to prove a point. I thought, well, sure, this can work. What they're telling me sounds fantastic, but everything in me tells me that isn't possible. Um, so it is to do with how your body responds to the stimulus. So <clears throat> to kind of summarize it, when you go along to a regular gym, most people are working out inefficiently and ineffectively. With Fit20, you do compound exercises, so multiple muscle groups, and you push yourself to the limit. So you do one set to failure. So what that means is you'll do, let's say, chest press until you can't go anymore. And you do it in a slow and steady and controlled manner. And what that does is it sends a strong signal to your body to get fitter and stronger. So if you, let's use the analogy of a battery, muscles have their own energy store and the different muscle fiber types work in different ways. But let's say your battery's full, your chest muscles, shoulders, you're working out, it's around about 80% because you know, you've been doing some other stuff. But in that, time that you do the next day, we're discharging that battery as much as we can to the point where you can't physically go anymore and then you do another exercise and another but then after the workout as such what that does to your body is it sends strong signals to it to say i need to replenish the battery and work to become more efficient so it recharges you your building muscle which is protective. It's the biggest organ in our body. Um, and it's just magic in how it works. Over the next week, your body is replenishing itself, getting fitter, repairing. Uh, oh, I think we've lost Matt. <laughs> So Matt, we had a little glitch on our on our technology, but we're back. And you were telling us about how I think Zoom needs to go to Fit Twenty this morning. Uh, <laughs> you were telling us about how the batteries go to um, to nil in that twenty minute process, but then your body mm. learns to recover and get, I guess, stronger and fitter. Is that strong, right? Strong, stronger and fitter. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, sorry, go on. So it, yeah, of course. So um, it does exactly that. It, it sends a strong signal to our body. It's um, it's working with our genes essentially. So, um, if you look back, back to um, our ancestors, you know the reason we survived is that they were the fittest. So, if you look looking back to hunting other times, we were either well, we we're probably great at two things: at hunting and getting away from things trying to hunt us. Um, so, it's those brief periods of intense exertion that make all the difference. Well, and I guess you go in on a Monday morning for your 20 minutes. I assume the knock-on effect of that is you are more active and refreshed across the week anyway. So you'll end up doing more than yeah. the 20 minutes. It's not about exercising for 20 minutes across a week, but that exactly, one yeah. so it's, intense um, space helps you across the, the week, I assume. Yeah, it's, a, it's an enabler is, is the way I like to look at it. Um, so it's a great complement to other interests so for example um some of the members um are very active so we have runners we have people that are keen tennis players golfers um even down to sort of doing things like you know people that have got big gardens it helps them stay strong and fit so that you can get the most out of that um but then of course we get the other end of the spectrum where people say i genuinely don't have time for anything but this but at least they're doing yeah, it's something. something. I guess something's better than nothing in that respect. And, and I guess the exactly. fact that they're deliberately choosing that time, they, they recognise it's important to do, which I think a lot of people, yeah, I guess, forget. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, at best, they forget it. Yeah. At worst, they neglect it. Um, yeah. So yeah. 
and it helps on a, on a number of levels as well. So it's not just the physical. It helps with positive mindset, um, with your kind of general well-being because of how it helps to repair the body and um, make it more resilient. Mm. Yeah, and I and I guess yeah, yeah from a from a physical health as well. You know, when we get tired mentally, it opens us up to physical illness as well so i assume if you're more resilient to physical illness you can still get tired and recover quicker mm -hmm. i guess the the benefits of it are just mm -hmm. are just incredible I'll, I'll drop a link in the in the um description and the article that supports this it's fit 20 isn't it oh I'll, uh, I'll, I'll share 20, it yeah. across because sure. it sounds it sounds magic to, <laughs> to be honest <laughs> um <laughs> it is so, magic. so matt it'd be um I, I guess just as we head into it's a rounded here, it'd be nice to um, be nice to give the the listeners a few tips or ideas about what they can do to, I guess, check in, um, prevent, identify, I guess, with themselves, and if if they're at risk of or heading towards um, burnout. So, so what would uh -huh. you what would you offer to people to sort of say? measures for noticing um signs of burnout mm -hmm. how to check if you're at risk of burnout mm -hmm. um and what can we do to prevent it i mean we've touched on the the fitness side of things what else can we do to prevent so if you've got a few tips around noticing checking in uh, mm -hmm. and prevention that'd be really helpful okay uh, noticing that is the probably the the biggest hurdle the first step um, are the one that is the hardest to kind of to acknowledge um, because you've got to stop ultimately and say, yeah, I, I am burnt out or yes, I do need help. Um, and as we've already talked about, we're generally not very good at that. Yeah. Um, so it, I think it's around being vulnerable and sort of saying to your mate or whoever you feel comfortable with, um, I think you could do with some help here. Um, and that doesn't look like, you know, going on a night out. <laughs> it looks like having a, uh, a helpful conversation about the, the steps that you can take to, you know, help you recharge ultimately. And, and give yourself a bit of time back. Um, you talked very much about, or we've talked on themes about having something for ourselves around self-development, and that is a huge thing, a huge thing, and a, a huge part of what I teach is around um, mindset and self-development. So um, maybe if you feel called to, trying things like meditation, mindfulness, you know, these are kind of tools that I, I use in the program. Um, but they're very much about being. So when we're trapped in sort of dad mode, we're doing and we're busy. And our mind sort of in the future or in the past project the future. It can take a bit of time to be here with what is and acknowledging what's kind of coming up in the moment. Then that is a a huge first step um what was the next one sorry Bob. Uh, i was going to say how can we check in is there a, is there a measure to sort of say because obviously if we can if we can look back and notice what can we check if we're close to burnout if we notice mm. what the signs are at any stage how can we check mm. where we are and if we yeah. need to if we need to pause well it manifests in in different ways for different people as as the way things go but a lot of the symptoms are I would say fairly common. So extreme fatigue and exhaustion, um, you know, waking up and not feeling like you've had sufficient sleep or still feeling tired. That's a, a definite red flag. Um, and of course, at the moment, there are things like long COVID and, you know, all, all these kind of post viral type fatigue symptoms, which is very much what I experienced. So, you know, they manifest very much in extreme fatigue and um just feeling like you're treading water you know like you you might notice that 
you're not performing particularly effectively or efficiently at work. You know, you, you, you're just kind of getting through and doing the bare minimum and it, everything feels a struggle. Um, you might have sort of brain fog and that kind of cloudy thinking and you're not as sharp as you used to be. Um, all these things are definite sort of warning signs and, and little red flags. Mm. And then I guess if you if you notice yourself in that position, mm -hmm. like we just mentioned previously, you need to find that outlet and you need to find someone who might be outside of, I guess, your regular social pattern because it's not about going for a night out. <laughs> but it, it, it could be someone like yourself, for example. Yeah. It could be a, a network, a new network where the topic is around that. Something that's a bit different to, I guess, break that rhythm and and force that stop to happen potentially. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and I guess just as we as we round up here, Matt, um, the cures are obviously more than we have time to to discuss in great depth today. But what sort of what sort of things could we do to to look after ourselves better if we say, you know what, I am heading to this, mm. and I need some quick quick wins. Break. I need some some quick steps to say right. I'm in check with myself until I find a professional to work with or a network who I can talk to. What can I do if mm. I show the signs of this? I need to get better at it. What can yeah. I do? Okay, great question. I would say probably the thing that us men find is literally stopping and doing nothing. So taking time out to, and I mean during the day, to either sit or lie down with nothing at all happening. So you take your phone out of the room, you take your laptop out of the room, you turn off any anything in coming in and just allowing yourself to have that time and resting. And I, that might, if you are sort of seriously burnt out or approaching that, it might be that you nod off for a bit. So well, that's great. You, that's a, a sure warning sign that you that you need that rest, that you need that break. Um, a big part of the practices that I teach and that really benefited me um, was that kind of active rest. Um, it's a practice called yoga nidra. So you basically lie down and <clears throat> um, surrender to what is. And and that for most men is quite quite a the challenge i imagine quite a big thing. <laughs> yeah it's uh because how many times do we stop i mean I, i've i've often uh, said all right i'm going for a lie down for 20 minutes while kids are doing whatever they're doing but do you know what the amount of times i'll go up and i'll have this and i'll be i'm, I'm resting but i'm checking my emails it's yeah. it's not really resting is it <laughs> No, it's just it's laying not, down working yeah. but it, it, it's so so easy to do and it, it's just habit based yeah. and these device these devices are designed to be addictive yeah absolutely and i think it, yeah the best solution for that is leave it in a separate room right i could lock it yes. in my office and walk away yeah. um yeah. so so there are things we need to do and i think it ultimately it comes down to as you say breaking a few habits i think that's a, a great shout mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but personal responsibility as well isn't it i think that yes. time to, to check in to hold ourselves accountable to ourselves if to no one else you know we've got to do it for ourselves haven't we and i think there's there's some good stuff mm. we can do there and certainly around the warning signs and, and checking in i think it's it's super important um, yeah. and, and then if if you need further help um people like yourself um mm. and, and i guess on that matt how can people connect or or, or find you what's um What's the best way of reaching out and connecting with with yourself? Yeah, of course. I'll I'll share details with you, Rob, and uh, you know feel free to put a link and stuff in the in the show notes or or whatever it's called. Um, however, just recently over Christmas, I, I put together a a brief training, um, a masterclass on overwhelm and how to um how to best manage overwhelm because it came up for me in the lead up to Christmas. You know, it's quite a busy time um it's kind of like becoming a dad again you know you're doing everything else and then you've got christmas to contend with <laughs> and you're thinking how am i going to fit in buying all these presents and buying all the food that we buy 
crazily at Christmas. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, how am I going to do that and take care of business and then finish everything I need to finish in time for Christmas and then have that extended period of time out and, you know, how am I going to get there and, and everything be okay? And overwhelm is something that was definitely a, a precipitating factor to my burnout. So it's a half hour masterclass on um, four steps you can take to kind of better manage overwhelm. And that'll give you a taste of sort of how I work and the methods that I use. Um, I've got the link for that. I can't remember the URL off the top of my head. Well, I'll, I'll add that to um, descriptions and articles and stuff that, that sort of complement this video. Mm. But I, I'm glad you mentioned overwhelm because the research we did uh, during COVID and after COVID suggests that in, in working dads, overwhelm's just through the roof, as is mm -hmm. anxiety and guilt, um, yeah. not knowing where to turn ultimately um, because mm. we keep saying yes to everything. Yes. And there's a lot of external pressures from work, from business, from family that just keep shoveling things on. And I guess there's only so much we can we can put on until something something breaks. So I'll, yeah. I'll be sure to add that URL. Yeah. The um, analogy I use, yeah. The, the analogy I use for overwhelm is um, if you, when you learn to, you kind of take it at time. So typically you'll start two balls, one hand, and then you add in a third. And then as you progress, you just add in more. And obviously the more you, that you have up in the air, the harder it is to keep them afloat. And this is like becoming a dad. You know, you, you're juggling three balls and then you've got another really big one that comes along. Um, and we spend that much time being busy thinking about how we're keeping the things up in the air that we don't really move forward. We don't take time to sort of stop and address them individually. Mm. And so just keep it going. Yeah. This, uh, we're just adding more into the mix. So, so you know, end of year, Christmas comes along. We're juggling away quite happily and then we've got some extra stuff to deal with. And then we drop one of those balls and we have to, we have to start again. <laughs> yeah, and Christmas is the time we should all stop and reflect and be with family, but I'm mm. sure nine times out of ten it's it's a more stressful occasion than it than it needs to be. Um, so, so, yeah, be sure to drop that link to me and I'll share it across uh, across with everyone. But, but Matt, okay. that's, um, it's been a fantastic um, open and honest discussion, so thanks for, for sharing so openly about burnout your experiences of it. I think, I think those lived experiences make for only a better, um, I guess, service provision uh, to help others, don't they? Um, we, mm, we can help absolutely. based on our own experiences. I think that's, that's a great way to do it. And um, yeah, burnout is an important topic. And I, I'm glad that people like yourself are, are doing work to, to resolve it and, and support people that might be suffering it. So, so thank you very much for sparing an hour uh, of, your, of your busy morning with us. Um, I hope this helps people watching and listening. Uh, Matt, thank you very much, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Cheers, nice Rob. One. Cheers, Matt. Take care. See ya.